Absolutely. I'm seeing some interesting charts you got here in the background of your trading room. Yeah. Yeah, man. So this is kind of what I specialize in. My, my main focus is day trading a lot of the times where I just kind of look at shorter term time frames and figure out if I can do my best to carve out a little profits here and there every single day. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> uh, what about you, man? What's your specialty? What's your time frame? Yeah, well, this is definitely interesting to me because it's a, it's a strategy that I do not know a whole lot about. I, I chatted the other day with the CMT, which uh, I'm from Houston, so I always thought CMT stood for country music television. As somebody <laughs> from Nashville, you can also appreciate that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, a chartered market technician, you know, and kind of t seeing these strategies that, that he was seeing was really an eye-opener. Uh, I run a company called Seven Investing. We've got a website, seveninvesting.com, and we are basically every month finding our best long-term opportunities mm. in the stock market. Mm. And we kind of look at that from a bunch of different lenses. You know, are you a growth investor? Are you a value investor? Are you a dividend investor? Whatever the specialty or the forte is, we kind of want to put a full buffet of options out there. Uh, but we got a lot of options right now for sure because everything in the market, at least, or not everything, but there are definitely a lot of bargains in the market to choose from. Yeah, I would have to totally agree with you on that, man. And I got your website pulled up. I don't know if you still have Zoom open, but this is, I found Simon through, I think you're friends with Matthew uh, because you both at some point worked at Motley Fool. Is that right? Yep, and Matt is actually now working with Seven Investing. If you're oh, talking nice. about Matt Cochran, he's, yeah. he's one of our uh, lead advisors with Seven Investing now. Oh, beautiful, man. Beautiful. Well, break it down for me just a little bit. I mean, kind of walk me through what is it that you look at when you're talking through growth investing or value investing? Like, what's, what's the difference and what do you look for? Sure, yeah. So my forte is, is kind of focused on innovation. I, I'm a self-described growth investor because I like to see how markets are changing over time. And that involves going to conferences, you know, talking to people who are a lot smarter than I am about what they see that's going on out there. Mm. And then we put on our thinking caps and say, okay, well, if this is where the addressable market is, is shifting, how are companies capitalizing to take advantage of that change? And so some of them, I mean, right now we see some incredible changes taking place in the media industry. People aren't just subscribing to bundled cable subscriptions anymore. There's a lot more over the top and on demand streaming. What is that going to mean for advertising, which is still a primary means of, of companies reaching out to consumers in their households, artificial intelligence. I mean, you see Amazon has put now billions of dollars and 10,000 engineers on Alexa because they want to get into your home and understand the intent of the questions you're asking. I mean, that can totally wow. change yeah. e-commerce and retail, right? And then healthcare. I mean, healthcare has become so much more objective now versus just, just subjectively uh, seeing symptoms that patients are coming in. So we kind of think about it in terms of like the, from the highest level and then kind of how is that going to affect companies and then what are the stocks to take advantage of that? What is that? Sorry, I've never had anyone call me in my entire life on that number. <laughs> That's the weirdest it's thing. It's not ever. me. <laughs> Very cool. Okay. Well, no, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, so when you're talking about Alexa and you're talking about going to conferences and asking people, I mean, what, what type of conferences are you going to? How do you find those conferences? And well, there used to be a lot more before this coronavirus thing kicked in. Uh, you know, yeah. there were industry conferences that, you know, now it's basically a, a grinding halt for all of those. But South by Southwest was going to be just a couple of weeks ago. I was signed up and uh, ready to enjoy a week up in Austin for that one. Uh, there's a bio conference in San Diego. We've got the collision conference that's up in Toronto. I mean, there's kind of these mega conferences and then smaller regional ones too, right? Like cloud computing conference, healthcare conference, stuff like that. Uh, for me, it's, it's kind of an eye opener to see at the higher level what's going on, uh, especially for a, a stock investor. You know, our, our typical time frame is three to five years. But I also am, am really interested in some of the strategies that you guys are working on out there because it's a lot of institutional money being put to work, right? And you can see a lot of those trades taking place and those, those strategies kind of forming over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's like, you're exactly right. I think that's, I like what you mentioned what, about the advertising and how people are going to try to switch that up with not only artificial intelligence, but also video games and there's this one company I think it's interesting called iClick. I'm sure you heard of that one, ICLK. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's phenomenal to me how they're trying to get some footholds in the advertising space on video games. 
because with video games, it's all digital real estate and it can be switched out and, and moved however they want for where you are in the world. So if you're playing a video game and you live in Nashville, Tennessee, you could get an ad for X, Y, Z type of thing versus someone who lives in Brazil, they're going to get an entirely different ad. It's so true. And those sporting events, those e-sporting events are now attracting more eyeballs. Than Oh yeah. <laughs> More than just somebody watching on the TV. Mm. Man, I mean, so I did not know that that outpaced the finals. That is that is bananas. It was really incredible. How There's huge trends. Yeah. How does uh, Tencent play into that, in your opinion? Well, Tencent's partnered with a company called Billy Billy. So Tencent is, is also, they're kind of playing both sides of it, right? They're a game maker themselves uh, that's making the video games and developing them and then publishing themselves. But then also you've kind of got this, this new platforms, these new platforms that are distributing and broadcasting too. And so Tencent is one of the most unique companies in the world. They've got their hands in everything, Jeremy. Um, almost like a soft bank that doesn't have as much risk if you want to think about it that way. Yeah. But they are definitely capitalizing on that esports movement. Yeah, they absolutely are. And when you're looking through these fundamentals, is there anything specifically that you're looking for or something that really jumps out at you? Do you read through all the 10 Ks? Do you try to really pour into it or is it just kind of trying to find that hidden gem? For me, it's kind of a combination of a couple of things. First of all, what's the R&D line item look like? Um, you have some companies that are really just kind of taking their profits and paying them out as dividends or steady as she goes kind of companies. And then you got companies like Tesla that's plowing every dollar that it makes into building a, a gigafactory in Shanghai and building out this full self-driving mode for its cars, you know, and basically just full steam ahead, you know, foot on the accelerator, pardon the pun, but that are just totally investing in their future. And that's really an interesting company to me mm. too. We can talk about Tesla more, but for me, it's, it's the innovators, you know, what, how is the market changing? Who are the companies that are plowing money into something that's going to take shape in a year, two years, three years out. So R and D budgets, one thing. And then the other is just relative valuation. Uh, whether you think about it in terms of price to sales, price to gross margin, price to operating margin, price to cash, cash flow, price to free cash flow, whatever your uh, desired metric would be, um, look at that and how that's trending over time. And is the market giving you an opportunity on an innovator that's looking like it's a value company in the market? Got it. Yeah. So research and development, that's, that's interesting. How do you know if they're researching something worthwhile or something dumb? I mean, a lot of it's track record, right? Look yeah. at the management team and do they have the caliper to actually pull this off or are they just going to, light up money, a bunch of money on fire. Right. Um, examples of that. I mean, there was a couple of years ago that 3d printing was all the rage, right? Yes. And every company was going out and just buying, you know, these 3d printers that could print out birthday cakes for your kids or, you know, these little plastic uh, gifts for Christmas and stuff. And, and it really wasn't sustainable. It was, um, that would be R and D spend that I would think would be not as effective. But then you also saw some 3D printing companies, even at that same time frame, they were using things like titanium to 3D print um, parts for aerospace companies or medical implants and stuff like that is obviously a, a really, really highly valued application. So it, it's kind of different ways to look at it. At the end of the day, it's like value is going to rise to the top. And those are the kind of companies that we want to look for. What are some that are jumping out at you right now that you think are interesting kind of on the longer term? I know you mentioned that three to five year time horizon. Yeah, I think that one thing that's really interesting, we were talking about media and I'm sure everyone's kind of seen this shift where you've got uh, these, these apps or these, these streaming apps where you can watch individual programs rather than just kind of, you've got your AT&T or Comcast bundled cable bill. Yep. Right. Like now I can get Hulu, I can get Fox, I can get Cheddar, I can get, you know, whatever, whatever station, country music, television, Jeremy, whatever we want to watch, uh, we can watch it without having to pay for the, the full subscription. But in my opinion, you know, good content is expensive. Um, 
you only got so many hours in the day, you know, there's only 24 hours. Uh, I suggest no one work more than 22 of those, <laughs> at least on the weekends. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, you know, time is precious, so you can't watch everything out there. So you've got kind of these, these, these what used to be called channels, now apps, uh, spending really a lot of money on really good content. Mm -hmm. And to pay for that, you're starting to see it be more and more ad supported, right? So Hulu is ad supported. You can pay a certain amount, but you've also got advertisements that show up. Yep. And so what I'm trying to figure out, one, one trend that really is interesting to me is how are you placing these advertisements into these streaming apps that know a lot about you, right? They know that you're from Nashville. They know that I'm from Houston. Um, they probably know that you just took a trip to Utah and to the West Coast and saw some awesome scenery. But it's more and more demographic, so it's a personalized advertisement that's showing up in all the TV shows that you're watching, especially on connected TV. And that's a trend that I think is going to be very different than just mm. these huge you know, massive ad placements that used to go to ESPN and Disney Channel and all this stuff, mm -hmm. where now it's more of a personalized ad going to a specific person. Uh, the companies that are getting ahead of that, I think, are, are very interesting right now. That is fun. And I was, I was scrolling through some investing. I didn't know that Austin was one of your boys, too. That's so cool. He's a great investor, man. He is really on top of what's going on in cloud computing right now. Yeah, he is. He really is. So I've interviewed him. I've interviewed Matthew. So yeah, you were just the next best person. <laughs> so I might have to talk <laughs> to you. smart guy. And Steve, too. Yeah, I was about to say, I might have to reach out to Steve and kind of chat with him and pick his brain. Because honestly, man, like you mentioned, I, I do day trade. I do like the shorter term you know, moves. And a lot of it's math-based. And a lot of it's just really pattern-based. But long-term investing is always going to win. And it's always been what's excited me so much because finding those companies and finding those opportunities that a lot of people just aren't talking about are exciting to me. Uh, Planet Fitness, for example, I liked Planet Fitness a long time ago um, after the IPO, like mid 2016, you know, going into that summer season, you know, that January, 2016, January to 2017, January was just a monster, like, you know, 75% run on Planet Fitness, all because I thought to myself, well, people are going to be working out more. They're going to try to get the beach body starting in January. You know, revenue is going to go up. Let me go pour over their revenues and see how much they're actually making. And since I know that a lot of people go to Planet Fitness, and ironically enough, they have a kind of a hard time canceling, even if they don't go and they're not actually there, that company is still getting the revenue. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, there's a lot of other companies, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on on this recent sell-off. But I mean, so many of them have just gotten punished, right? Oh my! Another God. one we looked at recently was was Live Nation, right, for concerts. Oh. And everybody's thinking, oh, it's going to be the end of concerts. Nobody can have more than ten people in a in a space at the same time. And so the stock, the last I checked, was down something like seventy five percent in the last month. Bananas. Um, for obvious reasons. Yep. But then you also think about, you know, you walk down the income statement, you look at fundamentally what's going on. Live Nation, its business is, is promoting concerts. So, yes, we've got to ride this out. You know, as coronavirus is going to take shape and, you know, there's not going to be any concerts for several months. But it's not the end of the world for Live Nation, in my opinion. Correct. Because you've got a company that still has got significantly less operating expenses as it weathers out this storm. Correct. 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 And I think, so, so to bring it full circle, I had a really good friend of mine who, who lives in Nashville. He's actually a Christian artist. Uh, he's from the Dominican Republic. He has a, he's, he's kind of like a celebrity down there in the DR. But in Nashville, he's also a, a, a really good rock player and Christian rock player. Anyway. Long story short, he reaches out to me about Live Nation because he is really in tune with what they're doing. He knows what they're doing. He knows a lot of people that work there. And as you mentioned, it's not the end of the world. They're working on figuring out new ways to have, you know, streaming built into the concerts, to have different packages and different things. Because I do personally believe that the coronavirus, all of this is just a massive, massive overextension of hype of some kind. I don't know if it's specifically strictly media based or if there's some type of really weird conspiracy theory, but I feel like in my opinion, um, it's valid in the sense that people are getting sick and they're unfortunately, there are people who are passing away because of the sickness, but in general, just as far as sheer numbers go, it still is far, far less invasive or, uh, and damaging than anything else we're dealing with in the world right now. 
Uh, I mean, just malaria, for example, you know, killed more people this week than coronavirus will ever kill. So I just think we're not focusing on the exact right thing. And that's kind of what caused, you know, companies like uh, the airline companies and Planet Fitness had like a 75% drop and Live Nation had a 75% drop. So when he called me, he was asking me when he should buy Live Nation. I didn't tell him specifically when he should buy it, but I was kind of giving him some prices and some thoughts that I had and some kind of time frames. But I agree with you, man. I mean, that was a, a dramatic drop on a really strong, powerful company. Yeah, and, and like you had mentioned about Live Nation kind of streaming these concerts and, and doing events online, now, I, I think that that's going to be a trend you see in, in every industry, right? Not just yeah. for entertainment, but yeah. it, it, I kind of think of every recession brings an opportunity with the yeah. two. In 2001, you know, we saw the, the dot-com bubble burst and what happened? Well, websites shifted from being based on web traffic and advertising for their valuations to being based on subscriptions, right? Sure. They needed a more predictable revenue stream from something like that. And then you see 2008, you know, there's these kind of these poor uh, internal controls for a lot of the banks. They were making some, some bad loans, unfortunately. And so banks started getting smarter about the data they were looking at. And you see this new FinTech trend, like you're talking about that Matt Cochran, my colleague looks at mm. um, that, that, that started a whole new, a whole new wave of companies. FinTech companies have made a, a killing over the last decade. And, and I think that what you just mentioned is going to be something that happens for retail and for healthcare too, which is things that people used to go, go do in person. Um, obviously, a lot of people were shopping on Amazon, but a lot of people were not. It's still e-commerce is still significantly less than 50% of total retail in America. Yeah. And this has been really the spur that, that's got people now buying things online that they didn't have to before. Um, and the same thing for hospitals too. I, I think there's going to be a lot more um, telehealth appointments where you're doing a consultation with a doctor over the internet mm. over something like a zoom call like we've got right now uh, mm -hmm. rather than going into the hospitals because you just saw that, that we're totally un unequipped to handle the spike in people going to, to hospitals when there's an outbreak like this yeah yeah agreed and that was teledoc i mean that's that's one that i think austin liked uh not austin um i forget who was mentioning that one but teledoc that's had a pretty massive run up and that's kind of what they specialize in, right? Like the over the phone healthcare consultation thing. Yes. And they're also integrated with a lot of insurers too. So they got the payers mm. that'll pay for those visits. That's so smart to get, you got to get integrated with health, you know, with insurance companies. That's, that's the moat. That's the, that's it. Yep. Yep. I mean, look at all state just surging back Uh big, big day for a lot of companies today. A lot of stocks are up, really, really large. Uh, all, I mean, the companies that like, yeah, get, getting hit like Allstate and Progressive. I just don't see why. <laughs> I don't see why. <laughs> That's the thing is, it's just one of those things where the whole market's going to have some type of reaction to all of this. But I do think it's short lived. Um, you know, a year and a half, two years from now, max. I think everything's going to be back to normal and we're good to go. That's the best case scenario. I mean, worst case scenario, we could see some more lows. But I don't think it's going to be absolutely irrevocably damageable, I don't think. Yeah, I agree. We're, we're going to bounce back from this. It's a matter of time. You know, we're seeing some really good treatments and vaccines being worked on right now already in human trials for those things. Um, it, it's a matter of time and uh, a matter of how much money is this going to go into the stimulus program. We've already seen some actions out of that. Um, stay tuned, right? Keep, keep seeing what, what developments come out of something like that. But for an investor, for a long-term investor, I'm not worried that the coronavirus is going to be um, a, a five-year trend that we're still talking about in 2025. It could be. I could be wrong, but uh, you know, there's, there's a, <laughs> there's the investor in me thinks that there's a lot of opportunities right now with the market selling yep. some companies off 75%. Yeah. Uh, talk to me a little bit about. I mean, what, what sector do you do you have a specific focus? Like you, you mentioned that Austin doing a lot of cloud computing. I mean, do you have one that's really, really narrow like that? Yeah, so mine is a little bit more general based around the concept of disruptive innovation, which is okay. basically just you've got companies that are, that are attacking these huge markets out there uh, that are doing things differently. And that is winning them a lot of business as customers come around to seeing what they're seeing. And so a perfect example of that that I see right now, Jeremy, is there's a company called Redfin, if you're familiar with them. Ah, uh, yeah, man, RDFN. You got yes, it. Yeah, so Redfin, I mean, he, yeah, I mean, you see it getting crushed, right? I mean, this is a company that is a, it's an online brokerage for real estate. And so 
the traditional way that real estate transactions take place is when you're buying a new home, you've got an agent, uh, you pay 6% of the closing price once the close goes through, or once the transaction goes through, and the agent collects that, you know, that commission. And that's $80 billion a year of those checks that get cut for all the houses that are getting sold across the country. Mm. And, and Redfin is basically um, doing this in one of two ways. They're one saying, okay, all of our agents, we're just going to pay a fixed salary. And there's, they're not going to be, you know, trying to close as many deals as they can. We want to be in the best interest of customers, but we're going to keep our listing fees as low as possible. So you can list your home on Redfin for 1% as opposed to paying 6% for the traditional model. That's one method. It is just the, the savings and costs, which, you know, 6% versus 1% is a big deal for people that are uh, selling homes. It's the, you know, a, a huge amount of money for most people. Agreed. Or the other is they, they able to just buy it them, that you're, themselves. So say, hey, you know, we've got enough data to know what a fair offer is for this. Oh. If you don't want to list your house and deal with all this, if you pay a 7%, now it's 1% higher than the typical commission. If you pay a 7%, we'll make you an offer. We'll give you the cash value of that offer. And we're going to take it off your hands and we're going to sell it through our, our own system. And something like that, I mean, right now, Jeremy, you see that stock chart, right? People don't have a whole lot of disposable income, uh, nor the inclination to be out in public anyway. So nobody's going out and buying homes right now. Yep. But longer term, this is a disruptive company that's going to make some really big progress in that $80 billion of real estate commissions that's going on. This is one that's definitely on my radar. I love that. And I appreciate bringing that one up because I, I agree with you. I feel like the real estate agent, that whole, uh, I don't know, career is the right word, but job or, in, you know, that, that position is going to have to see some massive changes very soon because it's too easy to outsource most of that, you know? Yeah. And Redfin's taking advantage of those, those, those easy ways to outsource that. Right. Mm. Yeah, I agree. What, what do you feel about the meal service prep industry? Because I, I think that there's so much ability for it to be done right. And there's so many consumers. Do you see any, uh, any competition or any disruptor because Blue Apron's doing an absolutely awful job. So do you see anyone else out there that's even getting close? Uh, the only way that I see that working in my it's a space that I've avoided like the plague, I've stayed yeah. completely away from all those companies. But the thing that would be really interesting is if you have uh, drones or something that can autonomously deliver that without, yeah. without having to pay the human labor cost of getting people to drive around the city. Mm. So why'd you stay away from it? It's, it's just, it's, it's tough, man. I mean, even if you've got a subscription model, people aren't willing to pay a ton of money for that, but you still got to pay really, really high variable costs for getting people to deliver those, those meals. Yeah. Um, so it's a really high labor cost versus total revenue yeah. uh, business. That, that's just a tough one to make any money in, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree. I totally agree. And that's, uh, it, it's, the two things that have the highest markup in the world, right? Are software and perfume. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, so figure out, figure out ways to be in one of those two industries. You know, that those, you can have some really, really good gross uh, margins. JL is asking a question. He says, how much lobbying is going against companies like Redfin? Well, it's real estate, right? So it's a huge market. So of course there's going to be people pushing back on this, but uh, as of right now, uh, Redfin is already the, getting the most visitors to its site of any other online real estate brokerage out there. Mm-hmm. And at last check, I think it was something like 40 million unique visitors a, a month. Wow. Um, there's not 40 million people selling their houses every month, but there's 40 yep. million people that are interested yep. in, in what's going on out there. So I, that, that's a huge, that's more than 10% of America's population. Sure. He's already using this. So they're definitely making progress. Do you think Zillow would be in, interested in buying them out or is there anything like that that could ever happen? I, I can't, I can't comment publicly on Zillow right now. We've got okay. some, uh, some internal restrictions on talking about that one. So I, I can't That's take fair. that question. Right. Totally fair. Totally fair. So tell me about Yelp. What do you think about, or are you able to make any comment on Yelp? I mean, do you think this is as, as awful as I do. <laughs> it's, it's one of those that they had a credibility problem, right, Jeremy? Yeah, I mean, uh-huh. reviews are reviews are really important, but there was some allegations that Yelp was trying to strong arm some of those reviews. Yep. And I think that's just left a sour taste in a lot of people's mouths. Yep. 
Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I think it's one of those where you, you I mean, you, you know that their reviews either they're going to be real or they're not real as you kind of read through them, but the also the fact that they want people to pay for good reviews, they want people to pay extra amount of money to get these certain like listings and it's like it just it just rubs business owners the wrong way. Yeah, I agree. And that's something that, you know, once you've got kind of that that reputational hit like I think Yelp took, um it's tough to regain that. Mm -hmm. Do you see any, what kind of disruption do you see in the uh, like Grubhub? It's not really a meal delivery necessarily, but somewhat like not not meal prepping. But do you, do you think that Grubhub, Groupon are going to ever regain their control over this move that they once had, or is those are those two just going to kind of fizzle out and slowly go to zero? It was one that was really interesting. I mean, look at that. Look at what, what is that? 2013, Girl. 2014. Yeah. I mean, when did Groupon? When did they get their their acquisition offer? They had, they had a huge acquisition offer. I forget what how many how many zeros was on that check, but they they walked away from the money, and and that was not by that chart at least the right decision <laughs> to make. <laughs> uh, it's basically going down to the right instead of up and to the right as, yeah. as you would want that to to be. Yeah. Um. That's one that, you know, I, th I think it was interesting, but you've got to get a real critical mass for that to work. And it's really hard when you're competing against really big companies that have a lot more data than those guys do. I, I do think there's a, an opportunity to personalize the internet much more than it's being done right now. Uh, that's going to take a fundamental change on, on this whole uh, keywords and AdWords that we've built into the search models. That's going to have to change uh, for that to really work because people don't understand the intent of what people are searching for yet, at least based on, on how the internet's working right now. But I, I do think that a lot of companies are trying to do what I think Groupon was trying to do, which is personalize entertainment, personalize the internet uh, based on what they think that they know about you as a consumer. Mm. And that's what, I mean, a lot of companies, a lot of the social media companies are, I think, trying to do, you know, Pinterest, Snapchat, you know, Facebook with Instagram and everything. And they're just trying to really have those tailor-made individualized custom experiences. Do you have any opinion on a company like Pinterest? Not on Pinterest specifically. I do agree with the trend that there's something there. Um, I'm not sure we, we have a clear winner in that just yet, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and Etsy, do you think Etsy is going to be able to have some form of good solid long-term competition against Amazon and Walmart or is it uh, is it slowly going to fizzle its way out as well they're using a lot of machine learning right now so Etsy's an interesting one because they really are one of those pioneers in, in artificial intelligence right so they're they're looking at, at these all of these transactions and all of these pages that people are viewing and piecing together what they know about what people want to buy. And, and Etsy is different than something like Amazon, right? Where Amazon, you might just be going on and buying batteries because it's a everyday kind of purchase, right? You just buy yep. stuff on Amazon, yep. kind of like going to Walmart. But on Etsy, it's, it's more, much more personalized because you've got homemade art stuff. You've got things that are personalized crafts. This is something that's much more unique to an individual person. You can learn more about that person than just, okay, you know, me and somebody else in Alaska is, is buying batteries on Amazon right now. We may or may not be the same type of consumer, um, but Etsy's got a lot more interesting data. And so they're really using AI to start mining some of that. So that, that's one that's more interesting to me. Hmm. I like it. People love the, love the words machine learning and artificial intelligence. If the company's using that appropriately, or at least even mentioning that they're trying it, I think it's going to excite a lot of investors. So last question for you, Mr. You Simon. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, how do you think about that in terms of trading, the technicals and the stuff that you look at? How do you think that machine learning is, is impacting that world? Whew, man, that's fun. It's very, very fun. Uh, I don't know a vast amount about specific, the actual the coding and the information that goes behind ML. Um, I'm trying to determine my, in a way how companies are going to grow and actually implement the ideas that they're coming up with and how they're going to start formulating everything. So for example, I'm, I'm working with a company that wants to go into Twitter and create an algorithm and a, and a robot that pretty much listens to what everyone is saying and what everyone's kind of talking about and then figure out a way if that is a, if it's a good decision or a bad decision. So if you have a bunch of people on Twitter 
that all feel a certain way about a stock, then you can kind of say, all right, well, if 93% of people feel this way, then let's go ahead and go the opposite because everyone's already in. So this, mm -hmm. this needs to kind of take a, take a little bit of a nosedive. So I do know companies that are doing things like that and they're working through those, uh, those procedures. Machine learning, not one of my expertise, but with algorithms, I think it just simply is adding a lot of liquidity to the market. And the drop that we had recently in the market tells me that the algorithms are doing their job. I know that sounds crazy, but with this really, really, really strong rebound that we're getting, kind of quick, aggressive rebound, this allows people to have some type of safety net and some type of security out there in the market because they're feeling like there's just no way we're ever going to stop. There's no way we're going to slow down. But you do have algorithms that go in when you have this really big limit down or this really big gap down. And they start providing liquidity. when They actually are the ones that start buying it. And they kind of help the, the other traders stay a little bit more on the sane side. So I think it's a good thing, man. I don't think it's a bad thing. I think we're sure it's a little bit of a fighting the robot type of situation, but at the end of the day, a lot of day trading, a lot of short, short term moves really just come down to a lot of math. Yeah. And it could be providing a lot of volatility, right? Which is opportunities for you to take advantage of. Yeah, exactly. I mean, as a, as a, just your normal small toad in the pond type of person, if you're able to look at a chart and you're able to carve out three or four points a day, and that's your goal there's nothing wrong with that at all and i think that's really really achievable so you're you're totally correct it just kind of provides that liquidity provides that uh volatility i think that's a really good thing when you were talking earlier about disruption and fintech companies do you think companies like stash or acorns are ever going to go public or are they ever going to merge with another company to kind of create their own fintech world on the markets yeah, Jeremy, man, I, that's out of my comfort zone to answer. I don't think I have an informed enough opinion. I, I do think that you're kind of, and, and I'll be willing to say that up front, that I know enough to know that I don't know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, 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 do, yeah. I do see in fintech that, that the acquisition costs of new customers are significantly lower than it has been for traditional banks, right? Mm. You've got companies out there that are online that are getting new people to sign up, give them deposits, use that money to make good loans. Even the traditional banks are trying to do their own online banking operations as efficiently as they can. Um, but that's just been a huge change of this traditional go in and shake someone's hand model uh, of banking. And it's continuing right now. That, that's the trend that I see in fintech continuing for quite some time. I mean, I mean it makes sense. There's, and, and there's so many people that need, that need help with their banking. I mean, there's a lot of people out there in the world who are working with uh, who need a bank account or more or less need some type of fluid liquidity or fluid currency to be able to be exchanged between what they want to do and how they want to do it. And if you have a brick and mortar bank that's in the U S you're not re really going to be able to serve other people. But if you have this bigger FinTech type of enterprise, you might be able to collect more data, collect more revenue, collect more currency and be able to transform more fluidly. Right. Yeah. And not even just in the U S right. I mean, let's talk about China. Mm. You know, you've got Ant Financial with Alibaba out there just collecting a ton of data. Oh my goodness. Uh, you see in India right now, India has got uh, several of its high denomination dollar uh, uh, paper currency out there that they've made illegal because they want everybody to transact digitally. And so now all of a sudden you've got a billion people that have been transacting traditionally with cash now doing things digitally and on their phones all the time. That's a data gold mine. Wow. You know, if you look at something like that and see transactions, I mean, the implications of something like that is going to be huge. Fintech is, is definitely an important trend for investors to pay attention to. Man, I love that. I think you are, I think Simon, that's, so, that's such a really, really good, valuable piece of information because what I see too, like you mentioned, is when, with that transaction history and that information, you are able to build customer profiles and customer personas that will eventually, in my opinion, take over and eradicate the credit system. Because now you have yes. more of a defined, how does this person pay? How often do they pay? Where do they pay? It's like, you know what? They're actually pretty credit worthy because I don't know how they're doing it, but they're paying it off, you know? But when it, when it comes to the credit system, I mean, there's one, one small thing can be such a giant disruptor on your credit score. I, I think that system is ripe for a change. Well, and even think about how much of the world is either underserved or, or not served at all for banking, right? We've, just like you mentioned, I completely agree with the statement you just made that people's credit scores have been traditionally the way that they get loans. 
uh, for a mortgage, for a small business loan, whatever it is, it's based on, okay, how do you check the boxes that are in our current system? But say that you're a farmer in Central America, that you don't have any credit cards and you've been transacting in cash. Yep. But every single, every single month, you know, you still make your payments like you're supposed to. You've still built up a history of transactions. Say that you start doing that with a mobile phone on a simple app. Instead of using cash, now you all of a sudden have got a, a history of, of making payments. You're a reputable person to lend money to. Correct. And there's there's hundreds of millions of people in the world like that out there. It's it's a quantum leap for banking, I think, in the next couple dec- in the next decade for sure. Yeah, I love it. Well, listeners, if you want to check out SevenInvesting.com, feel free to do so. Uh, like I said, Simon, I'm going to reach out to some of your other gentlemen and see if I can just hear their perspective on the world as well, because I love chatting with both Matthew and Austin. So uh, I really appreciate your time today, man. And if you guys are also on Twitter, I do follow Simon on Twitter. It's a great follow. You add a lot of value to the FinTwit community. So thanks, man, for being a part of that. Thank you for being on this program. And I appreciate all that you do for us as traders. Hey, Jeremy, I really appreciate you, man. And by the way, you have got the most positive energy, I think, of anyone I've met in my life, man. <laughs> You're like a guy that I like, I want to hang out with. This first interview we've done, I'm like, this is a guy I really want to hang out with sometime. Man. Um, thank you for having me on the show. I had a lot of fun. I appreciate that. Likewise. Well, we can easily hang out because that's, uh, you know, as soon as this whole flight situation starts calming down, let me know, man. I'm, I'm down doing it. We'll, we'll, we'll go back to Utah and Vegas and California, man. Count me in. Sounds good. All right, Simon, have a great rest of your week. Talk to you later. Thanks, Jeremy. See you, buddy. Well, folks, that was Simon Erickson with 7investing.com. Really good interview. Always love chatting with people who are smarter than myself in many different avenues, facets of the world. So if you do have Twitter, feel free to follow Simon. And my goal, my mission in life is to enrich lives with mentally liberating education. Hope you had a great day. As far as looking at the market before we finally wrap up, we are just on a firestorm. And we finally are having just the smallest, the cutest of pullbacks. And I'm going to try to figure out how that might impact some things. I'll keep a very, very close eye on Southwest here uh, for a bearish day trade, although I don't know if it's going to be an immaculate winner. Uh, It's just good to see the SPY pull back some because it was a storm for the bulls. All right, folks, thanks for tuning in. You guys rock. I'll be back for. 5 to 6 p.m. Eastern for Energy Wednesday. And then, of course, we have our Module 3 for the Beginner Series tonight. You are amazing. And until next time, love life, love life, and trade life.